Two years ago, uh, in March of 2020, uh, the world went on pause. Uh, for me, I, I was just starting a choir tour uh, that got cut short um, the first day that we left. And, and truthfully, I was excited because I could think of far better ways uh, to spend my spring break. Uh, but I didn't realize the level of what was happening until I got back to school. Uh, people were standing in circles, like far apart from one another, talking intently. Students were, were packing their bags and, and heading home. And, and I was thinking in my mind, like, it can't be this bad, like, can it? <laughs> Like, my roommates and I joked about having the coronavirus when we were all sick a few weeks beforehand. Was it COVID or was it the Thai food we ate? There are some questions we will not know until we meet Jesus. Um, but I thought to myself, this will pass quickly. Uh, me and that same group of friends even decided uh, to rent a cabin up in Big Bear to do a little staycation. Because we were thinking, what's the worst that could happen uh, but two days in, we ended up getting emails, notifications saying that the school wasn't only delayed, but it was canceled for the time being in person. I started hearing word of, of different people I knew getting sick. I didn't know what to think of it. And it wasn't until I was driving home on a completely empty 91 freeway to Texas, and I looked over at Abby and I thought, is this it? <laughs> You might have heard the news while at work or in a college or high school class, but, but one thing's for sure, life shifted for a season, did it not? See, when an event on this scale happens, it makes people dive into the deeper questions that everyone is asking internally, but not asking externally. See, for our parents' generation, people will ask, where were you on the day of 9-11? Of for uh, the past generation before them, it was, where were you when you heard Kennedy was shot or when World War I began and et cetera? You see, throughout history, every generation has these moments that make us ask these questions like, is this the end of the world? <laughs> what happens next? What does the Bible say about this? Is Jesus really coming back? See, this is an interesting topic uh, to discuss. And to be quite honest with you, it's a tricky topic to teach on because clarity regarding like the end times is seemingly very hard <laughs> to find these days. It's almost like there has been just a fog covering the truth that we find in the scriptures. And see, I wholeheartedly believe the enemy has mudded the waters, creating confusion and fear. See, end times theology, the book of Revelation, and even the passages the, the, like we're reading tonight have been stolen from the church by bad teaching and false narratives. Like, these passages should stir encouragement in our hearts, worship with our lives, and hope for our future, but many preach fear out of these texts. Like, did anyone, like, grow up reading or watching, like, the, the Left Behind series? Like, anybody in here? Anybody scarred in here? Just, okay, just a few couple, just so no Kirk Cameron or Nick Cage fans. That's, that's okay. Um, please don't watch those movies, because the scary, the scary truth is that people treat those stories like they are biblical truth. Or when people think about, like, the end of the world, they just imagine every Michael Bay film just happening all at one time. Or if you see people, you know, talk about the, the end times, you might see them use, like, maps or spreadsheets. And now in our day, people are talking about Russia and, like, how they're going to play in a, par a part in all this. And it ends up looking something like this, this meme right here, like, straight up, um, where, um, maybe, right here, um, where there's talking, they're just like, this is how it's all going to go down, man. Like, that's how, that's how people are sometimes talking about, you know, the end times. You might like conspiracy theories. Like, you might be superstitious. I'm a little stitious. Um, but I, I've been so excited to say that all week. I'm not going to lie. Um, I don't hate on that. Um, they're fun to talk about, truthfully. But it seems like many people want to cling to theories rather than biblical truth. 
See, a lot of the even weird views that we have about the end times, they kind of started in the late 1800s where there were systems of thought about the end times that were born alongside you know, mystery cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and, and Mormonism. And you see, people in the late 1800s were obsessed with the return of Christ. And it led to so many flawed readings of the book of Revelation, some of them rooted in truth and others not. And you see, we, I, you have to know this. Like the passage that we're reading today, it was never meant for fear. See, John is, is warning the first century church about false teaching like happening about Jesus in the church. But see, John actually writes these things not only to warn but also to comfort. And, and think about this. John was most likely Jesus' best friend. <laughs> And he oftentimes wrote to, to clarify wacky sayings that were happening in the church. So if there was anyone that I would listen to, it would probably be John. And I know much throughout my life regarding like topics like the, the end times, you know, I, I've held on to the truth that all I need to know is that Jesus will return. And while I do believe that is the main thing, it's the main thing that we need to grasp onto I realized studying and reading 1 John that John believed these young Christians needed to know some other warnings as well regarding the period of time that they live in, the, the period of time that we live in. You know, if, if John thought that uh, this subject didn't matter, he, he wouldn't have written about it. Now, I know that we are not Ephesus. <laughs> or a, a church along Asia Minor, the, the group that this was written to. And I know that this letter wasn't written to, to me, a, a follower of Jesus, uh, in 2023, living in Southern California. You see, the Bible wasn't specifically written to us in our context. It was written to you know, the first century church who was facing unique first century challenges. But hear this, friends. The Bible was written for you. I'm going to repeat that. The Bible wasn't written to us, it was written for us. This means that Jesus wants to say something to you tonight. That means John, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wants to communicate something to you today. And remember, God is not the God of confusion. He wants to speak directly to your heart. So tonight we're going to walk through, you know, this passage and we're going to address, you know, these three questions that are up here. We're going to ask like the, the what, the who, and the how. What is the last hour? Who is the Antichrist and how do we abide in the true Christ? And luckily, you know, I don't feel the pressure uh, to cover all of the bases because as we've seen in this letter, John repeats himself quite a bit. And it's, it's because the Jewish people learned through repetition. And as we keep going throughout this book, it's almost like John it, it will make like a point over here. Um, and then he'll go on to another topic, talk about this. And then he'll go right back to the topic over here. So if you feel like we are repeating ourselves in this series, uh, don't blame us. Uh, blame John. Um, but, but truthfully, what an opportunity to really soak in the truth of this letter and not just hear about it and forget it a week later. You know what I'm saying? So essentially, this is not the last time in this series we will talk about this or we'll address the topic of the last hour or the end of days. And I also don't believe every question uh, should be answered in a sermon. I believe much of this should be worked out in discipleship and studying the scriptures together in community. So um, here's my challenge to you real quick. If questions come to mind, write them down. <laughs> If you, whether you are a follower of Jesus in this room or not, write down uh, these questions. We want to have so much humility approaching a, a passage like this. But before we jump into our text, I want to teach one basic rule of, of hermeneutics. You're like, Grantham, hermeneutics, why use big word when small word do trick? Um, so this way, as you grow in your relationship with Jesus and even want to read some some authors, some great authors throughout church history, and they use a word like hermeneutics, you can know what they're talking about. You can be like, yep, I know what that is. Um, so hermeneutics is simply the study of the Bible. Um, it means biblical interpretation. It's how do we interpret what is being said. So one basic rule of hermeneutics, and it is this. Always let the clear 
interpret the unclear. Always let the clear interpret the unclear. So where the Bible is super clear on stuff, that should be like our interpretive lens. It should be the glasses that we look through when when studying something like this. And where the, the Bible is not so clear, for example, when John writes the book of Revelation, he's writing apocalyptic literature. So there's allegory and there's images uh, being used. So what we can do is we can use the teachings of Jesus, Paul, and, and John, even when he's clear, to interpret when John is being unclear. So does that make sense to everybody? You in here? Little Bible study lesson you can stick in your pocket for later. Uh, so let's break down these verses and specifically the vocabulary used in each verse. So First John 2.18, he says, children, it is the last hour And as you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. So the first observation we have, John is saying, children, young believers, it is the last hour. What does that even mean? (laughs) Like, well, that's our first question. Point number one, what is the last hour? And the last hour is simply the time between uh, when Jesus died and rose from the grave And then when Jesus returns, we even did a whole series on this at the beginning of the year, talking about what it means to follow Jesus in this time period. You see, when Jesus rose from the grave, he ushered in the last hour, and he called us to go make disciples, to baptize, to teach the way of Jesus to the world, and he says, I am coming back for you, and I've promised you my presence. Sometimes it's referred to as the last days or the last times, but to define it in its most simple terms, it is the time period between the first and second coming of Jesus. That is what the last hour is. And according to Jesus and the apostles, including John in this letter, we are currently living in the last times, the last days, the last hour. And it's interesting, John says the reason we know it's the last hour is that you heard an antichrist is coming, (laughs) and many antichrists have come. So this leads us into our second question, who is the antichrist? And notice how John said here, you hear that a singular antichrist is coming. So basically, um, stay with me here, word on the street in the first century churches was that in the final time, just before Jesus returned, um, the Bible says that a person of great demonic power will rise up in rebellion against the true Christ and his people and deceive masses of people from following Jesus. See, God prophesied through his prophets in the Old Testament, and we, we know that this will happen. Um, Even uh, the name Antichrist, it means something. It's important to understand the prefix anti can mean like the opposite of or like the instead of. So the Antichrist is basically the opposite Jesus or the instead of Jesus. But I think especially um, in America, in, in Western culture, many people have focused on the idea of the opposite Jesus a little too much. Because when, when they think about this idea in their heads, they might think, okay, well, uh, Jesus um, did good, so the Antichrist is, is going to do bad. <laughs> or like, Jesus said lies, so, or, G- whoa, hear me out. Whoa, put it in reverse, Terry, we're going back. Jesus said truth, so the Antichrist is going to say lies. And you see, please don't tell Daniel I just uh, said that in a message. Um, man, that's tough. Bear with me. So this emphasizes the idea of the opposite Jesus a little too much. But truthfully, I think the Antichrist will be more of an instead of Jesus, where he will look wonderful, where this person will look charming and successful. This person will be the ultimate winner and appear as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. So the Bible is not saying that Lord Voldemort or Emperor Sidious will show up on the scene. Like, it's, it's not saying that at all. He will look good to most and deceive many inside and outside the church. Even Paul refers to him as the man of lawlessness. Uh, listen to Paul's letter warning the church in Thessalonica basically about the same thing in 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, let no one deceive you in any way. 
For that day the, of Christ's second coming will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So we read that there will be this great rebellion and towards the second coming of Jesus and it will happen from inside the church. So if you're looking for like a definition, just so we can all remain on the same page, so this antichrist right here, if you're looking for a definition, it means there is a singular figure that opposes Jesus at the end of time that will lead a rebellion from inside the church proclaiming himself to be God. Now all of this might, like just your anxiety levels are just rising to the roof or you're like, oh, this is terrifying. But I just want to encourage you for a moment because this is what will happen to the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist. Spoiler alert for the end of the Bible if you haven't read it all the way through. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2.8, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Like, it, it's going to happen. Whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Now, I haven't even seen in like a movie someone get killed by somebody's breath. Like how bad of a villain do you have to be to get killed by Jesus just going like, whew, like, this is our, God, if you haven't read the Bible all the way through, Jesus wins, don't be intimidated by this. Like, you might be thinking, yeah, like, let's go get this guy. Like, let's get him. But we have to remember, the figure of the Antichrist, it's not John's focus. I would argue it's not Paul's focus. And I don't think it should be our focus either. I don't think it's our job to speculate on who this will be someday. Now, your meme on Facebook or that YouTuber that thinks they're a theologian, they're like, Antichrist, it's, it's Vladimir Putin, or it's Kanye, it's Jordan Peterson, or it's Dua Lipa. But um, you see, think about this. Um, those videos are out there, folks. People have been trying to call this for the past 2,000 years. What we can hold on to is Jesus said, like, this is going to happen, but it's going to happen like a thief in the night. I mean, we, we don't know when this is going to happen, um, but Paul even says this person will be revealed. But you see, both Paul and John, they were focusing on something else. When they were writing to these young churches, they were wanting to focus on something else. Look um, at, at the passage we're about to go into. You see, both of them are honing in on the fact that there are false teachers at work right now. Even Jesus himself said that there will be false Christs and false prophets that will appear and perform signs and miracles and deceive followers of Jesus. There were opponents of Christ at work during their day, and they, it's happening right now. They're at work right now. John calls these opponents the spirit of the Antichrist, and Paul refers towards them as the mystery of lawlessness that is at work. You see, Paul, through the power of the Holy Spirit, when he was writing, could see in the future that there will be a time in human history where lawlessness, sin, will be on huge levels and on full display. Paul calls it the mystery of lawlessness because I, he's not necessarily seeing things perfectly. But truthfully, I, I think then they were living in the mystery of lawlessness. I think in 2023, we live in the broad daylight of lawlessness. Look at our world. You might be thinking in your mind, well, how could a good God let all of this happen? Like, why not, why, why doesn't God just like snap, like, that this person doesn't have to, that these antichrists don't even have to be here, or this spirit doesn't have to, like, why doesn't he just take it all away? Well, you have to remind yourself the full story of the scriptures, the story that we are a part of, because when we're studying the Bible, we can't just isolate a singular passage. We have to read it in light of the full story. Remember, we have to let the clear interpret the unclear. So we have to remember, we know that when God created the heavens and the earth, that he created it what? He called it what? 
good. Yeah, it was a little bit. You're like, I think it was good. He cre- created, it was good. He didn't, when he created humans, he didn't create us to be like robots where we do everything that God tells us to do. No, he created us with a choice where we choose to be in relationship with him. This beautiful union between God and man. It's how everything was meant to be. But because we have a choice, we choose wrong so many times. I know I do. And this is where this problem of sin enters the picture. And you see sin, the wrong things that we have done, it it separates us from God because we've fallen short of who God is. We deserve to be uh, separated from him. This, This penalty of death, complete separation from God in a place called hell. And there is even a rebellion of lawlessness, the spirit of lawlessness that's inside of us. And what did God do? He sent his son Jesus, fully God and fully man, to live, to die, and to rise again. So if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that Jesus rose from the dead, we will have a saving relationship with Jesus. And we have this relationship that's now rekindled. This is the gospel. And we know that Jesus has come. Today, so we, we know that he's come. We still live in a sinful and broken world. There are many people, and there will be many people, that oppose Christ, even inside the church today. See, even inside the church, there's people that say Jesus is not God and literally oppose him. And John is saying that is the spirit of the Antichrist. So John is saying that there are professing Christians in their community of believers in Ephesus, most likely that they've profess faith in Jesus, they've been baptized, they were maybe part of like regular participants in the life of the church, yet now it's almost like they've changed their minds. Their beliefs are evolving. Specifically, John says in verse 22 that they are denying that Jesus is the Christ. Notice they're not denying everything about Jesus. It's not like they're denying his existence. They're probably not denying that that Jesus is holy in some sense like a messenger or a prophet They're not denying everything about Jesus, but they're denying something very specific and essential about Jesus, and that he's the Christ, that he is God. You see, these antichrist people, the the, the spirit that, that even lives in our world today, they were denying the person and exclusive work of Jesus, yet they were still claiming to have fellowship with the Father. Now, John says, that's impossible, Verse 22 says, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. You might say, well, wait. They weren't denying the Father. They were just denying that Jesus is the Son of God. And John is saying, that's not how this works. You don't get to pick and choose. Verse 23 says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Even Jesus himself says this, John 14, 6, that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you're looking for a definition for the Antichrist spirit, this is what it is. Uh, The Antichrist spirit is many false teachers have come and will come from inside the church, causing deception, denying that Jesus is God. He's warning them. Look at at this in verse 19. I, I know we're taking our time here, but bear with me. Bear with me. Look at this verse. Verse 19 They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. Now, does this mean that everyone who doesn't believe Jesus is God is an antichrist? No, of course not. Like you were thinking in your mind, like, Do I have, like, the Antichrist spirit or, like, am I the Antichrist? Uh, I almost titled uh, this message that question, and I was like, don't want to stir the pot too much. Um, But you see, when a person or a group separates themselves into, like, an elite, holier-than-thou community, and they, they say that they claim a deeper understanding of, like, other than the gospel, then John is saying, beware. And if people leave the faith and oppose Jesus, then they never had a true faith in God in the first place. Like, that's literally what the passage says. John wasn't talking about someone who just leaves the church to go begin attending another good church. Like, he's not saying that at all. 
He's saying those who leave the community of God's people altogether. This reveals that they were never really part of God's people to begin with. John Stott says it like this, perhaps most visible church members are also members of the invisible church, the mystical body of Christ, but some are not. They are with us, yet do not really belong to us. They share our earthly company, but not our heavenly birth. Now, in light of all this, with we know that there's a prophecy about this, this Antichrist that is coming, and that we know that the spirit of lawlessness is at work today. Don't believe that the church is going to vanish or like come to nothing because of these figures on earth. No, think about this. Jesus is coming back for his bride at the end of the story, his bride being the church. And he's not coming back for like a weak and puny bride. Like Jesus is coming back for a babe, <laughs> like a babe of the church. If there's one thing we can know, listen, if there's one thing we can know that throughout church history is that the history of the church, that the church prevails through persecution and suffering, Always. This is always how the church works, that the church grows through it. And we are con right now currently going through this because there, there are false teachers at work today. And they're growing the church. If you don't believe me, literally just go on TikTok. Like, there are false teachers teaching heresies every single day. Like, people don't want to believe in the truth. Um, even in, in three weeks, we were talking about how do we discern, like, uh, the truth, and how do we discern different spirits. So keep coming back, and we'll continue to dive deep into this. But I do want to mention one of the biggest false teachings we see today, especially in our age group. It is where people like the idea of Jesus, but they don't like Jesus' commands. And we can't divorce Jesus from his words. Sometimes obeying Christ is hard. I know that. But friends, know this. It is worth it. Jesus is worth everything. Because like, even think about this, like, like I can't have, like, I, I can't have a relationship with, with Dominic here if I don't believe what Dominic says, right? <laughs> You can't have a relationship with Jesus if, if you don't believe in the words he says. People want to pick and choose Jesus where, I like what Jesus says about this, but over here I disagree. And we as Christians, we need to be weary of that. We also need to be weary of the things that we fill ourselves up with. I pray for discernment over our people, over our community. What are you filling yourself up with? Um, the other night, um, me and Abby were taking a, a friend to uh, the Ontario airport, and, and before we left, uh, we decided, let's go get uh, Blaze Pizza. And I don't know what LeBron James has been putting in those pies, but as I was driving back from the airport home, that was one of the, the hardest drives I've ever had in my life. Um, I thought I, I was going to pull over. I was like, Abby, it's, it's done. I think I'll, I'll die. Like, I had to go to the bathroom so bad like it was so bad like once once we finally like parked at the house I like I booked it I was like I don't care like who knows like sorry Abby like this is the only thing that matters like let me get in the house and and it's funny I going to bed that night I was like I'm never gonna have blaze pizza ever again but I woke up the next morning I was like you know what sounds good blaze <laughs> blaze pizza sounds great right now and funny enough I think we do this in our lives where we fill ourselves up with these, with these teachings, with, the, with these things that don't fill us up at the end of the day, and we continue to do it. Why? We're sinners, I know that. We're, we're all growing in sanctification, but Christian, beware. Just because like that YouTube video has a good thumbnail doesn't mean that they are preaching the true Jesus. Have discernment and test it according to the gospel. And, and this leads us into our, our third and final question. How do we abide in the true Christ? How do we know if, if we're truly Christians? Remember, this is John's purpose in this letter, 1 John 5.13. I write these things to you so that you may know you have eternal life. That's his purpose in this. So 
Look at verses 20 through 21 and 24 through 25. He says, but you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. And because no lie is of the truth, let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. Then this is the promise that he made to us eternal life. Notice at the beginning here, he says, if you have been anointed by the Holy One. And basically, like anointing is the idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit and being blessed by the Holy Spirit, the the third person of the Trinity, the presence of God manifested here on earth. See, this is something that is a common property of, of all Christians, that like when you believe um, and when you repent and believe and confess that Jesus is Lord, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, that the, the presence of God doesn't just dwell in a church, no, he dwells inside the temple, you're the temple now. So this is a property of all of us, but it's also something that we can and should become more submitted and responsive to. This is why every single service, we pray, come Holy Spirit. If you have a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, but we are asking to be more aware of him, and because of the anointing the Holy Spirit has given to his believers, we possess the resources for knowing the the truth of the gospel. And there's even discernment from the Spirit that that will never contradict Jesus and his teachings. John says here, I write to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know it. Because no lies of the truth. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. So how do we abide in the true Christ? Simply, it's this, know and believe the gospel. Hold on to the truth of Jesus and what God's character is displayed by the scriptures. Um, in American banks, uh, you might know this, but like the training program for like new employees at a bank, um, what they do is they, they never look at counterfeit bills or like false bills. All they do, hour after hour, day after day, as they train, they handle authentic currency until they are so familiar with the true that they can not possibly be fooled with the false. And this is the way that we should be with the word of God and with the gospel. That we know it so well that when somebody shares a false gospel, you can share with them the love and and the message of the real gospel. Or to know and believe the gospel so much that even if an angel were to come to you and preach a false gospel to you, you can be like, go to H-E double hockey sticks, angel. Like, Even like, this is what Paul says. Listen to this. Galatians 1, 8 through 9. This is crazy. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul could not be more subtle. He says it twice. And why would Paul warn us of an angel coming to you and preaching a different gospel Because they do. It is an angel of darkness. This is why it is a major possibility that Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was actually visited by an angel in the 1800s. It's possible. I just don't think Joseph Smith ever paid attention to Paul's warning. And like even I believe there's no doubt that the prophet Muhammad in Islam encountered an angel. I just don't believe it was an angel of the Lord. This is our warning, and it's literally right here, smack dab, in the Bible. Remember, you are on the winning side. Believe the gospel. Let it abide in you. Young adults, do you realize the time period that we live in? It is wartime for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's wartime, but except our war is not fought with with weapons of, of mass destruction. No, it's, it's fought with love and it's fought with the truth of Jesus. You see, don't forget it. Since we live in a world that, uh, that lawlessness and apathy has run rampant, we easily forget this truth. 
we easily forget the truth that we've all been, like a lot of us have even, some of you have been raised up in church and have heard this since the very, very beginning. But we forget it, don't we? I know I do. We easily forget. Even we see the Israelites all throughout the Bible forgot who he is and forgot that they are his people. Like, you remember when God delivers the, the Israelites out of Egypt, like in the Exodus story? Like, there is no greater um, display of God's power than in, like, the Exodus story. And, like, literally a few days later, after God delivers them, all the Israelites are like, oh, Egypt sounds so good right now. Like, I miss the food in Egypt. It's like, bro, like, are you kidding me? God just RKO'd RKO every Egyptian god and split the sea for you and for you to be out of slavery and you want to go back to Egypt? But we do the same thing. Don't forget what's inside of you. Hold on to the truth. Hold on to the truth of Jesus. Like, will Christians have disagreements all over time? Yes, people have different opinions on things. I think that's a part of that's, that's part of being in the family of God. But what's important is that we know the gospel. And I think some people want to go bat want to go to bat against each other because of like secondary or like third tertiary issues, um, which I think sometimes leads to more problems. Like, is it important to have good theology? Absolutely, yes. But we have to know what the main thing is. What's the foundation of all this? What's the foundation of your faith? Keep the main thing, the main thing. Abide in Jesus. John tells us in his gospel that Jesus is the vine. and We are the branches. Love Jesus supremely and stay connected to him relationally. Friends, posture your heart and actions towards abiding in Jesus daily. You hearing me? We can do this together, y'all. We weren't meant to do this alone. So right now, why don't you just stand to your feet as we, as we go into a, a time uh, of worship. I, I want to end, like, um, even with just a verse of Scripture in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter says this, because I, truthfully, you, you might be in here and you're like, this is all overwhelming. Or even um, what could be on your heart right now is like, man, I'm thinking about... Um, my friend or my family member that doesn't know Jesus. I, 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 I don't want Jesus to come back before then. Well, listen to what Peter says here. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should re or any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, God's not slow to come back, but he's actually, he's actually being patient with us. So we can share the gospel with, with the people around us and even know the gospel. How beautiful is it that, that Jesus in his omniscience, in his omnipotence, the power of God, that he even wants us to get to know him right now while we're still on earth. How incredible is that? Jesus wants a relationship with you. Abide in him. And that's why we're even so big on stuff like going to the missions course. Even if you're not gonna go be an overseas missionary. But we want to learn how we can play a part in this. This is our call. And I believe right now, Jesus wants to minister to you. Even in this moment, as we, as we've, as we go into a time of, of worship. So I just want to invite you right now, wherever you are, just close your eyes and just open up your hands right in front of you. This isn't to be weird or do anything like that. It's more just to, to posture ourselves that we want the Holy Spirit to come. So come, Holy Spirit. Minister to us, Lord. I, I'm even reminded of the truth that, that someday every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more death, no more suffering. Let us hold on to that. And God, I know that every person in here has felt, you know, the loss of a relationship or even the deathly loss of a person close to them or, or sickness. Or we, we see the, the lawlessness run rampant all throughout our life. Lord, help us just be close to you. Help us abide in you. Help us abide in the hope that you, that, that, that you give to us, that Christ is coming back. So, Lord, we love you. 
Help us worship tonight. God, I pray if there's anybody that needs prayer for anything, anything in their life, whether it's personally or someone that they know, God, I pray that they can come join a prayer partner right now and and go receive prayer. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's worship together.